Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to our worship service today. It's really good to see you all out. It's obviously uh, Reformation Sunday, and I wanted to thank Jan and Haley for covering for Michelle while she's gone and providing music. That's a catchy tune, you know, that's really going to go somewhere. So, uh, <laughs> in terms of announcements, the this is a busy congregation, and I don't know what we'd do if we didn't have the coronavirus to sort of slow things down a little bit. Uh, tonight, we have the pork and sauerkraut dinner, and it will be as much like it normally is as we can possibly make it and still accommodate for the virus. Do you have a headcount? About 60. About 60. So that's a pretty good turnout for us, twice what we had at the picnic, so we're pleased with that. Um, in addition to eating well, uh, we're hoping that some of the younger kids will come in their costumes. You can come in your costume, and uh, we're asking people to bring, you know, purchased individual candy, and instead of the kids going around at the table, we're going to have them kind of parade across and give them something, always trying to keep the virus in check. Um, Following that, we're having a intentional interim event where we talk about St. John's future. And I'm really interested to see what you all have come up with praying about this and hopefully jotting down ideas and so forth. So that's tonight. Uh, on the 1st of November, next Sunday, is All Saints Day. And we are trying to compile as complete a list as we can of people to be remembered in the service. If you have someone, they don't have to be a member here, they just need to be somebody that's important to you, and Teresa will take that information. We're hoping to be able to put pictures up along with it, so um, you know we're multi-sensory people, and we're hoping that that helps, but we want to remember and pray for uh, all the saints that have gone before us. On the 8th of November, so two weeks from today, is the annual congregational meeting, and this constitutes one of the <laughs> times that we tell you about it so that, you know, foretold is forewarned or whatever. The important meeting this year, we have the budget to pass. We also have uh, vacancies for the parish council that need to be filled, and we're forming a call committee. All of that requires uh, voting members to come out and say, yes, this is what we want done. And uh, so that's all coming. We have a concert from Dr. Horton that's in your bulletin. And what else am I missing? We already did the pumpkin carving. Uh, Advent Family Fun Day on November 15th. <sighs> yes, yeah, so pushing out one more week. Um, Advent's almost on us, and we are going to convert the Sunday school time on the 15th of November into a family craft event where you are going to make a, it, uh, it's not a, a wreath, it's on pa a paper product. You're going to make your own wreath. Candles will equip you with devotional material so that you can count the Sundays during Advent. So that's going to be on the 15th. So there's a lot going on here. Take your bulletin home with you so that you have it, put it in your phone and all that good stuff. So, uh, uh, and, and for these events like the concert, it's a great way to invite family and friends to come to the church. Uh, one of the things that we have discovered looking at uh, attendance and membership and so forth, when somebody's been gone for a while, it's really difficult to come back in the door. And I think something like a, an organ harpsichord concert uh, is a really safe way for somebody to come in and break the ice, so to speak. So it's an opportunity for people who've never been here before. It's an opportunity for somebody that's been away for a while. Uh, but the most important piece is you invite these folks, and um, so I'll lift that up to you. If you would please stand and join with me in the brief order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, 
one God who creates, redeems, and sustains us in all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gifts of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Spirit, Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Let us pray. O Lord God, you are the holy lawgiver. You are the salvation of your people. By your Spirit, renew us in your covenant love and train us to care tenderly for all our neighbors. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. 
Please read Psalm 1 responsibly. After then, they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall be destroyed. Our second reading comes from 1 Thessalonians. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, as and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we are gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you have become very dear to us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew in the 23rd chapter. Put on the spot by the Pharisees, Jesus displays wisdom by summarizing the law of God in just two commandments and by demonstrating the Messiah must be more than the son of David. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think? Whose son, what do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. And he said to them, how is it then that David, by the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you, Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, this section of Matthew is what I, in my mind, tend to think of as rather early in the week that we call Holy Week. Jesus has triumphantly entered into the city Palm Sunday, he's cleansed the temple, and he's been teaching, and his teachings have been interrupted by representatives of the different 
power groups of the day, some of them political, some of them religious, all of them kind of bleeding from one category into the other. And they have been trying to derail Jesus. They've been trying to uh, get him tripped up in his words and uh, separate him from his base and those kinds of things that I think we're seeing way too much of right now because of the election. This is one more of these stories. He, he's always come up with a parable about the vineyard and uh, they try to trip him up with a silly question about some poor woman that was married to seven brothers in a row in a Levitical marriage and in heaven whose husband will she have or who will be her husband and all these kinds of things just to trick him. So this one is kind of interesting. There, you can see the separation between the group called the Sadducees, which is typically the priestly families, and what was characteristic about them was uh, they focused almost exclusively on the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, as the scriptures, and the reason they did that was that's where God gives Moses the instructions about the Levites being the priests, and he gives them very detailed instruction about the tabernacle and the worship services and rituals, and that's where they derive their power from. There's not a lot about resurrection from the dead in the Torah, and so the Sadducees as a group didn't believe in it. Most of the material about resurrection as it's emerging within Judaism, uh, you find in the Psalms and in the prophetic utterances, and then some of the books that are in the Apocrypha, like uh, the Maccabees, for example. And the Pharisees read those books, and resurrection from the dead's a theme there, and so they believed in it. So that was the main division. The Pharisees were normal, ordinary people who were really particularly dedicated to keeping the law of Moses. They had this group within them of scribes that were people that actually wrote out the scriptures and uh, were able to answer the, the technical questions and so forth from it. And that's why the scribes and the Pharisees are connected to each other. So you see a division here between those two groups. So the Pharisees are all caucusing together, and how do we get Jesus? And so they pick a lawyer. They're bright people. Can't get into law school if you're not. And so this one individual comes to him and says, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Well, the law of Moses is 613 specific tenets that have to do with everything from your relationship with God to worship to interpersonal relationships, business relationships, commerce, uh, family relationships. What's the most important part? It's not a bad question, really. I mean, if to answer it, you would have to know a lot and be able to prioritize. And so Jesus comes up with what is a really good answer. He goes to Deuteronomy, part of the Torah. He goes to chapter six, and I think it picks up what he actually quotes is at verse five. It's the famous Shema prayer. And then it says, basically, love God with the totality of your being. Well, that's a good answer. But then Jesus can't help being Jesus. He throws in this little tiny minor detail. He says, you know, there's a second commandment. And he goes to another book in the Torah, Leviticus, chapter 19, about verse 18. We read it this morning. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus takes these two things, the love of God and the love of everybody that you come in contact with. And he puts the two of them together and they are inseparable. 
If you don't love your neighbor whom you can see, says John, how can you love God whom you can't see? It's a reflection on this. If you say you love God and hate your neighbor, that same John says you're a liar and the truth's not in you. Jesus jams these things together and he makes the, the life that we live rooted both horizontally in this relationship with our creator and vertically in our relationship with one another. Now I imagine that this lawyer was not expecting the second part of this answer. First part's good. Second one, pretty radical to put the two of them together is very creative. I think he might have asked, well, what do you mean by love? <laughs> you could see that, you know, that, that would play out in our political environment. Well, what does love mean? It's a choice. It is a conscious choice that you are going to behave in a way that builds your neighbor up. Jesus gets it from that self-same chapter that we just read in the Old Testament lesson today. And if you go back and you look at that, it's an interesting place because it says, um, you shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. Love, hate, you can approach the same issues positively or negatively, it's a way to go. But if I am refraining from hating my neighbor, then this next phrase, you shall reprove your neighbor. Well, that seems kind of odd. I'm supposed to, like, come up and offer corrective criticism to my neighbor? That's love? Well, it all has to do with relationship. I cannot go so far as to reprove my neighbor if I don't know my neighbor. If I haven't put a certain amount of effort into observation and conversation and involvement, I can't offer my neighbor the kind of reproof that would keep them from harm and put them in to rethink what they're doing and for them to choose to be in a place where they're in a good relationship with God and with one another. You know, in the business world these days, mentors are a big deal in the writing. Uh, they encourage uh, people that are entering into a career field at whatever age to find somebody to be a mentor so that you can talk over what's going on and what am I not seeing and how do you do this and um, we've seen it you know, for example in medicine for years you've always uh, you're always hearing about the attending physician and they have a bunch of residents and interns that are learning from them and the idea is that this senior doctor who's been around the, the horn a couple of times can advise on how to look at it, how to think about it, how to do the procedures, and, and so forth. Uh, we see it with teachers. You know, you have uh, somebody coming up in the educational program and they get to spend time as a student teacher in a classroom with a senior teacher and they get an opportunity to apply the trade on live students with somebody looking over their shoulder and guiding them. We do it with Lutheran pastors. We have one year out of the Ford Seminary where they're assigned to a church and they uh, have a senior pastor that is schooling them on how to do the job and then they get together with other interns and then uh, it's all a supervised, reflective effort so that you're not just making it up as you go along and hope that you don't do too much damage. That kind of reproof is loving. It seeks to guide in a way that builds the person up. And Jesus, when he says, love your neighbor, 
expects that kind of involvement in their life. Um, many Christians have reflected on what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself, and of course we're all very familiar with St. Paul, and he wrote what's a, the equivalent of a sonnet in 1 Corinthians 13 about love. And you, if you've ever been to a wedding, you probably heard it read. It comes up in the lectionary very regularly and so forth. Love is gentle, kind, long-suffering. Every one of the things that St. Paul uses to describe this God-like love of your neighbor is a choice. It's something that as a human being, you decide I'm going to act in this way instead of that way. You don't have to have ooey gooey warm feelings for somebody to do the loving actions that St. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13. You can, hopefully you're being nice, because nice is nice, polite's good, it's better not to provoke a fight, just keeps things simpler and so forth. But for me to be long-suffering, I decide that I'm going to act that way towards somebody, just as an example. And in fact, things like being patient and long-suffering kind of imply that maybe the other person's a little bit annoying to you. And you're choosing to overcome that. You're choosing to play the long game. You're choosing to build relationship and community over time. You are not going to be reactive when somebody says or does something that makes you annoyed. It's a choice. Now, we've learned from behavioral sciences that if you act in a certain way, uh, you'll come around emotionally. So it's really hard to invest yourself in a person's life and really care about their outcome and not care about them. So this love your neighbor is equally as important as loving God and it's something that lies in your power to choose to do. I would suggest that it's a lot easier if you ask the Holy Spirit to empower you. It's a lot easier if in your prayers you ask the Lord to allow you to perceive the persons involved in the situation as he does. It's kind of intimidating, frankly, because um, he'll usually start with you and show you what you look like to others. There's a little repentance of sin that needs to happen there, a little bit of contrition, a little bit of restitution, a little bit of personal choice to do something different so that you can be in the relationship. But he allows you to see it, to think about it, to choose courses of action. He gives courage when you pray in order to do it and to stay at it. And... He will bless, in the scriptures in Matthew 23, Jesus makes a point of encouraging um, forgiveness of sins. And he makes promises about being blessed beyond what you're giving out by following his guidance. So what he's done here is bring this period of confrontation to an end and he summarized it all in basically two sentences. And nobody's got a word to say to him about it. Chapter 23, where this takes place, ends with, I think, an angry Jesus, seven woes spoken against the the people of Jerusalem for not having listened to the prophets and the teachers and so forth that God has sent to them. And 
a statement about a, a judgment that's going to fall on that city among the generation of the people that he's talking to in the moment. But what's really interesting is even as he's saying this thing that's very dire and a very clear judgment, the attitude of his heart, and it comes out in his words, he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and murders those who are sent to you, how many times would I have gathered you like a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. Therefore, your house is left to you empty. And then he literally removes himself from the scene. There is a place where God has taught and sent and expected and if the people will not listen, the scariest thing in the scriptures is when God goes, go your own way. And I can tell you in every single case, it's not good. So what about us? Here we are on Reformation Sunday as Lutherans. You know, our Episcopalian brothers and sisters have an October 25th, last Sunday in the month of October, and they're Protestants, but they're not so enamored with Luther like we are. But in our own tradition, one of the things that we look at when we see Luther is someone who grows up in the tradition, he's steeped in it, man, the guy's a priest and a university professor and all that kind of stuff, and yet he's hungry for that relationship with God. He wants a relationship that is full and rich and real and genuine, and he's not willing to accept anything less, and that leads him on a path where he is looking for a gracious God that he's read about, and he finally experiences it. Where we are at this congregation, our national church, international, is at a point in time where it's totally appropriate for us to ask our Lord and God to show us the places where we haven't been listening, the places where we have chosen personal convenience and self-justification and then said, grace, grace, instead of the heart of the relationship with God, which is justice and mercy and obedience. The thing about a church that wants to be continually reforming is that it recognizes, you know, we're sinners. We don't necessarily go out of our way to do that, but we kind of fall into it pretty easily. We need to admit it. We need to go back to the Lord, say, blew that, please forgive. What's the right path? How do we go forward from here? And listen and do what he says. So that Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor, do justice, love mercy, obey what the Holy Spirit's saying. Great word, especially on a Reformation Sunday. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that even when you are provoked to strong emotion, that the thing that motivates you is a love for people. Help us to hear you, Lord God. Help us to struggle with issues like justice and mercy. And help us, regardless of the cost, to follow you wherever you go. 
We ask this boom of you in your name. Amen.
Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God. You reveal your glory as the glory of the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit, equal in majesty, undivided in splendor, one Lord, one God, ever to be adored in your eternal glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory, O in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, O in the highest, O in the highest. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. We praise you for the grace shown to your people in every age. The promise to Israel, the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land, the words of the prophets, and at this end of all the ages, the gift of your Son, who proclaimed the good news in word and deed, and was obedient to your will, even to giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant, in my blood, it's poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Therefore, O oh God, with this bread and cup, we remember the life our Lord offered for us, and believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory, and receive our inheritance with all of your saints in light. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and every place, and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to the banquet table, where Christ gives himself as food and drink. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. given for you, the body of Christ 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 given for you. 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 Break the body of Christ given for you. 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 Amen. Amen.